Hi, and welcome back to a new video. Today we can finally take it a little bit more relaxed because I can tell you the previous weeks were quite intense. If you think about the Intel launch and then also the AMD launch, I'm quite glad that they're over. And today we will talk about PCIe Gen 5 NVMe drives, which is a topic I avoided for a very long time, especially because they were not that interesting. They were very expensive and especially the thermals were an issue or are still an issue today. I'm pretty sure you remember a lot of the NVMe tests we did with all those obscure AliExpress heatsinks that we found and yeah, compared them with Gen 4 NVMe drives because they already have a very high power draw and require a lot of cooling. And at least from the early days of Gen 5 NVMe drives, it was even worse on these drives, which was the reason why I usually avoided them. Now I have the MP700 Elite from Corsair and this seems to be the first generation with a new controller that is much better, better when it comes to handling power draw and thermals and should be a lot easier to use. Not sure about the cost part though, I think Gen 5 drives are still very expensive but I want to look at different drives today and the power consumption of these. This video is sponsored by the new Thermal Grizzly 1851 contact frame for Intel AeroLake CPUs. From our testing, our contact frame can improve the temperatures on an overclocked 285K by up to 60 degrees Celsius if you switch from the normal Intel ILM and up to 40 degrees Celsius if you switch from the reduced load ILM. All feedback from the previous generation was taken into account and the frame is now easier to mount, features an additional isolation layer on the bottom and has new updated stainless steel screws. Check out the frame in the link below. PCIe Gen 3 NVMe drives usually have a power consumption of about 2 watt under load. It just depends on what kind of controller they're using, what kind of flash, if it's with a DRAM cache or not, but typically it's around 2 watt under load. The highest I think I saw under load was about 3 watt, which doesn't sound a lot, but you have to keep in mind that this is also a fairly small and thin PCB. They weight usually around 9 to 10 grams, so that's just a little bit of PCB, you have the controller on it, maybe some DRAM cache, some NAND flash, and that's basically it. So it's not a lot of mass. You can even calculate how long it takes to heat it up in, let's say, a theoretical environment without heat, so without passive cooling. I just typed it into ChatGPT to check what it would be, but heating this up from 20 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius, so 60 Kelvin, uh, with 2 watt under a theoretical environment without cooling, it takes about 570 seconds. So about 10 minutes to heat this up um, into a point where yeah, it just would be too warm and would probably throttle down. I think we should just double check that quickly if that kind of aligns with reality. That is probably the worst M.2 drive I have. Maybe the lowest power consumption, I'm not quite sure because it's not that easy to actually track or measure the power consumption. You would need some kind of like PCIe riser cable with yeah tracking the, the power wires of the PCIe drive because built in there is no tracking of the power consumption of those drives which makes it a little bit more difficult for reviews but I think just tracking how it heats up is already a good clue. In Crystal Disk Info we can see that I didn't use this drive very often, only powered on 19 times so it's still pretty much a virgin. I'm also not quite sure why it's listing X4 PCIe Gen 3 because at least on their website and also on the price comparison guide sales website it's listing X2 but yeah anyway. Even without doing anything you can see that the SSD heats up to a certain degree. We have 40 to 41 degrees Celsius. It's not attached to any heatsink and I'm only five minutes in Windows but it already reaches 40 degrees Celsius. Now I'm running Crystal Disk Mark to give it a little bit of load and you can see how it instantly heats up and yeah. I reset the timer on Hardware Info when I started the benchmark, but you can see already after like half a minute, this is yeah, approaching 60 degrees Celsius. Second run, it's about two and a half minutes of load without heatsink, and we are now at 70 degrees Celsius. You can always also check this in Hardware Info while running the test, if it's throttling down or not, if it's exceeding some thermal limit, but this is still fine, because it's like in line with what the SSD is supposed to do. I quickly had a peak of 79 degrees Celsius, which seemed to be still okay and within the limit. At least I can still see that its read and write rate is as expected. So I think it didn't throttle all the way yet because some SSDs you will have to reset once they reach or cross a certain point. But so far it's like five minutes full load and still yeah, doesn't exceed the thermal limit. 
I quickly saw 82 degrees Celsius. There was a slight drop in a ride for maybe like a second, but then it was back up to where it was supposed to be. Now it's over 10 minutes load and still not throttling. Now PCIe Gen 4 NVMe drives were introduced in 2019, that's already five years ago. And for example, the Corsair MP600, which was one of the early ones, they were all featuring, most of them, the Fison E16 controller, and they had a very high power consumption. From what I understand, that was mainly also because the E16 controller original, originally was not designed for PCIe Gen 4, but for Gen 3, and was just adapted, and that is why the, yeah, the power consumption and efficiency got a bit out of hand. It seems to be a similar thing for Gen 5 NVMe drives. At least the initial ones are also quite insane when it comes to the power draw with like six to seven watt under load. So I think we just throw in the crucial T700 now and give this a try under load. Again, same position in the motherboard. There's no active airflow somewhere. It's just the passive convection that will help a little bit. At least that drive I used a little bit more often, powered on 422 times, and as you can see, it's uh, Gen 5 with four lanes. Now the result of the high power draw, 61 degrees Celsius after not even four minutes in Windows, while the drive didn't do anything. You can see here, max read-write is below one megabyte, so it just didn't do anything at all. Now the question, how long can we sequential read-write? Well, 12,500 megabyte per second, for sure impressive. But also the temperature is ramping up very quickly and as you can see it's like it's not even 15 seconds and the SSD reached the point of getting too warm and it's throttling down and now it, it can't maintain the performance anymore. You might ask yourself now why is there such a disproportion between the power consumption and how long it lasts because this is like 2 watt power consumption, this is maybe 6 to 7, so we're talking about x3 difference in power consumption, but we're talking about x40 in terms of how long it lasts until it throttles. And that is mainly because of the very limited cooling of such, such a small PCB, small weight. With this you can maybe efficiently cool 1 to 1.5 watts with the convection and radiation of a thermal, and that's, that's basically it. And once you exceed this point by far, like what you do with such a drive, then you just run into the thermal limit like very, very quickly. And that's where we get back to the MP700 Elite from Corsair because this seems to be one of the first drives with the new Fison E31T controller, which at least from what I read online is much more efficient than the other commonly used controllers. So it's probably like half the power consumption, still very, very high performance. It is slower than the T700 from Crucial, I think by like 25%, but should still be interesting, especially when it comes to the cooling. Not sure why they put a heatsink on it. I mean, it says MP700 Elite with heatsink. I assume there's also one without. We will quickly turn it into one without. I mean, there would be a heatsink on it if you need it, but let's just remove it quickly. The comparison is also not that fair, to be fully honest, because they're just quite different SSDs. The T700 is much more a high-end SSD, at least from my point of view. It's with, if I remember correctly, 2 gigabyte of a DRAM cache, while this doesn't have any cache at all. It's, I mean, there's not really much on it compared to the Crucial SSD. You just have the Fison controller and two NAND flash chips, that's it. But it also means that less components will produce less heat, theoretically at least, or like very simplified. And there is more room on the PCB for cooling. The MP700 Elite, completely fresh drive, eight times only powered on, not even one hour of runtime, PCIe Gen 5 X4. Almost four minutes Windows idle again. It is not fully cold, but it's definitely colder than the Crucial. But what about load? It is expected that the SSD also increases in temperature fairly quickly. It won't make it without throttling, that's for sure. I just want to see what the difference is. Like, what is the improvement with the new controller? And it is ramping up, but not as quick. And it's still maintaining the 10 gigabyte per second. We finished a full five times read, five times write run without throttling. So that's not even too bad. 
We will just run a second time because I'm expecting once this passes 80 degrees Celsius that it should throttle down. Now at 80 degrees Celsius that is definitely the edge because you can see that it doesn't maintain the full write speed all the time. But I could overall run 10 times sequential read and write before it throttled down. There is a significant difference between the two Gen 5 drives. This is like 15 seconds under load and this is like one and a half minutes under load, which is like a big improvement in terms of like cooling and how reliable you can use the drive. Still, they're not like perfectly comparable. As I said before, this is a DRAM less um, SSD, so it doesn't have the cache on it. But then you also have to ask yourself the question if the cache is important for you or not. Most of these recent SSDs, because they use uh, the host memory buffer, they basically reserve some space in your normal memory of your system, of the host. That's why it's called host memory buffer. I think for this SSD, it's 64 megabyte. And then this is using this kind of cache on the memory instead of using the on SSD cache like the, the crucial SSD is doing. So you cannot perfectly compare it. But for most of the daily applications, at least from my experience, the cache is not needed. It's only needed if you have like very long reads and writes for whatever reason. And yeah. You have to ask yourself if that is even needed or not. But then again, you also have to ask yourself, does it even make sense to use a Gen 5 drive in a gaming system at all? Probably not. At least I don't see why you would use it. But for me, I just found it cool that there is a technical improvement. If you look at different generation of Gen 5 SSDs, because previously, if you look at those like T700 drives, even if you put it under this like typical mainboard cover, piece of aluminum heatsink thing, if you put a decent amount of load on it, this will still overheat and will lead to throttling. So that was often a problem why I always said like, you shouldn't use those Gen 5 drives in a normal gaming system. One last check with the heatsink mounted. There you can see how much difference the heatsink makes. Just a little bit of aluminum mass and three minutes, 35 degrees Celsius. Now the question, if we're running load, how long the SSD will sustain these write speeds with the stock heatsink under load? After six minutes, we're closing in on 60 degrees Celsius, but of course in that region still full read and write rate. Now after 10 minutes, finishing the last sequential write and it's a peak 64, I think even if we would run this another 10, I doubt that we would reach the 80 degrees Celsius mark. The MP700 from Corsair is definitely a step in the right direction when we're talking about the E31T controller from Fison, because it's fixing a lot of the previous issues when it comes to high power draw and cooling issues, which was always a problem, at least from my perspective, when we're talking about 5.0 devices or SSDs because they're commonly used on normal desktop motherboards and then you have to check if you're loading them because I assume that if you're buying a 5.0 SSD then you have some kind of use case for it and then you will probably load it as well and then you have to make sure that it's also sufficiently cooled. If that's not the case it doesn't make sense to get it. Now with this new controller this is much much easier to handle. The biggest problem, however, is still the price of those devices, 5.0 SSDs in general, especially if you compare it to something. It's a 4.0 drive, but the Lexar LM NM790, it's still two terabyte, but it costs less than half. Those go for about 120 to 130 euro here in Germany, and it's not that, that much slower. It's also without DRAM cache for gaming, probably not needed, and I mean, yeah, it's like 25% faster and costs less than half, so it's probably the much better option to get it. Still, I appreciate that there is a good development in this segment, that it's much more efficient now when it comes to the controller. Now we only probably have to get the price down on those 5.0 SSDs, otherwise probably doesn't make a lot of sense to get them. All right, thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.